Hello, football thinking fans. Welcome to the Total Football Analysis Champions League and Europa League podcast. You all probably know the members of our team by now, but it won't hurt to do another round of introduction. I'm your host, Daniele Proc, and I'm in great company today. From the La Liga squad, let me welcome on the show Alex Comzia. What's up, Alex? Thanks for having me. The EPL team has agreed to give us their podcast host, Chris Mumford, on loan for a few weeks. Much obliged, Chris. So excited. What a week of football. Oh, I completely agree. Also, let me welcome on the show football analyst Steve Coleman. What's up, Steve? Yeah, good morning, Daniel. How are you? Pretty good. And last but not least, football analyst Scott Martin, who is still trying to break down what happened to Varane last game against Man City. Scott, have you found any answers yet? Uh, just a lot of suffering, a lot of uh, internal stuff going on. There. But uh, so when you look at that game, um, where that came from, uh, I, I have no idea. That was probably Veron's worst match in a Manchester, or, sorry, uh, Real Madrid, sure. Um, just two very, very shocking displays uh, that led to the city goals. But... You know, you, you do understand when you, uh, you know, you look at the, the bigger picture, why it was so difficult for Veron to really play out of that kind of pressure. So City naturally uh, sticking to their philosophy, they came out in a very high aggressive press. Uh, in their 4-3-3, they, they really took the initiative to make sure that Real Madrid could not build through the middle. It made it very difficult to, to find entry into Cruz and Moldrich. Um, and we did see Cruz, both Cruz and Moldrich dropping very deep to offer support with Casemiro moving higher up the pitch. Uh, but even with, you know, two very press resistant players dropping back to help with the buildup, Real Madrid really struggled to find a way through that city press. Um, so I think ultimately what we really needed to see from Madrid was a little more uh, proactive uh, progression from both Carvajal and Mendy, the pockets of space were pretty minimal in the defensive half, but the ones that really stood out were the spaces on the wings. And when Mendy and Carvajal uh, received the ball as Madrid were building up, we really didn't see much of an, uh, an initiative to take that space and you know, even just take a little bit of a risk as you're, you're trying to break that city press. So, you know, I, I know you don't want to take many risks uh, as you're trying to build out of the back, but with City playing so high up the pitch and committing so many numbers forward, your options are play long and hope that you can connect to your forwards or take a chance, uh, you know, if you're 1v1 isolated in the wings. We didn't see either Carvajal or Mendy feel comfortable taking that kind of approach. And, you know, this is where... I really wish Zidane had started Marcelo. I think he was one of the big missing links. Uh, the other player I would have loved to see starting was Vinicius Jr. If anything, just to, to give someone to run behind the line and, and really provide some kind of a threat to the City back line. Because let's face it, the City's back line was very comfortable. The, the high press gave them a lot of coverage. The rest defense was outstanding. And the two holding mids really denied uh, much entry to Hazard. I mean, he really had to drop deep and into less uh, ideal spaces just to get a touch on the ball. So that, that missing link, that, that one guy who could really break the line and keep the, uh, the city defense honest was really missing. And Rodrigo, unfortunately, could not provide that. Yeah, and I'm thinking that maybe the fact that Real Madrid fullbacks were a little reluctant to go forward was because... Real Madrid was trying to stay in the game as long as possible. I mean, they were um, one be uh, the, the score was one to one, so they only needed one goal to take the game to extra time. You mentioned Hazard; uh, he had to drop deep. Was it uh, is it to blame for not being uh, as effective offensively, or uh, is Man City to you know praise for their defensive work? You have to praise Man City; they were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Real Madrid really hasn't been bullied that way all season. Uh, you think even with the top pressing teams in, in La Liga, they were never um, you know, under so much pressure to build out of the back. And you know, ultimately, I think what City did was they forced Real Madrid's defense, or midfield to drop really deep, and that really disconnected the midfielders from the forwards. So you know, that did require 
Hazard to drop in a little bit deeper. Rodrigo was even dropping deeper to receive. Uh, there was just no outlet to the forwards. Um, so, and, you know, as the midfield dropped deeper, uh, you know, that space between the lines opened up, and then just all of a sudden there was no way out. So that's where I do think they had to be a little more aggressive, especially since you had the two center backs and, you know, typically Cruz and Moultrits just in front of them, giving you some kind of a central presence. So with that, that um, you know, the, the four players right there in the middle, why not be a little bit more aggressive on the wings? or keep those, those forwards a little bit higher uh, just to stretch the field and, you know, maybe play along to keep City honest. So regardless, they, they couldn't find the solution. So let, let, me, let me give you my take on this. I said last week, the evil empire doesn't work without Darth Vader. And Darth Vader was not there. Uh, the Ramos is such an important playmaker to that buildup out of the back. And Varane was expected to do to to do the heavy lift, and he wasn't able to. And I thought they were going to be forced to go to the long ball, which I was actually surprised they didn't do more going to the long ball. I do think that if Vinicius was in the lineup, he probably could have increased the height on that, and it didn't happen. And what I saw was I saw the Man City system, and and hats off to Pep for – that it was absolutely stifling. And you're right. La Liga, they're just not going to get that sort of pressure. So they struggled. And I will tell you, you know, it's very funny how the pundits say, well, you know, Jesus is, is not that good. He's not as good as the finishers, Aguero. And that's still true. But that second goal that he put in where, where there was probably thigh height, and he was able to put that in. I just hats off to him. He's on a pathway to success going forward. I hope he remembers that every night he goes to bed and he's going to become a better striker if he does that. But to me, it was system trumped a, a major um, playmaker out. Hazard was not able to rise up to the occasion, probably because he's still playing injured. It was so cool seeing De Bruyne and Hazard kind of playing against each other. There were some plays where one was on e offense, one was on defense. And KDB is, is a full step better right now. Um, when, when Hazard gets healthy again, it, it could be different. But I just, I got to tell you, I, I love the tauntness of this match. It was super tight and it was, it was so nice to see really grown up soccer. Um, it's, it, it it wasn't expected. I, I what it, what I thought two zero was this this um, score line. No, I thought it was going to be three one, but uh, the outcome ended up being Real Madrid losing. And, and when, when you concede so early on in in the match in the way that Real Madrid did, there's this insecurity, especially in the back line, and that goes and seeps throughout the entire team. So, Scott, you mentioned, you know, why Real Madrid is not – they weren't as aggressive with their fullbacks. And it's it's so difficult when obviously, yeah, we've mentioned we don't have a Ramos. We don't have that leader at the back. Varane, who is supposed to be your leader, he's not performing well. You know, he's he, he seems – and his body language seemed insecure, and the way he was playing was very insecure. The midfield was – you know, being won by Man City, and we mentioned last week that this game could be absolutely won and would be won by the midfield battle. And it was it was incredible to watch these top class midfielders go up against each other. Modric was was not that effective. Uh, Benzema I thought was really good. You know, he still had he was a bright spot for them. I also would argue that Rodrigo was a bright spot for them with with his play on Benzema's goal. I do also think that Vinicius. Being in the lineup, you would have had to take out Hazard in this game, which, you know, obviously could have been a possibility as well. And you have these really bright, agile guys on the wing. It's not that Hazard is not that player, but like you mentioned, he likes to come deep, which is, I think, more favorable to Man City's style. But again, this, this all started from the first half. And the way they came out, I thought Madrid would have had a chance. But when you make these individual errors, it you just – you just can't do that against against the Manchester City team because then your fullbacks are thinking, okay, if we're I need to cover my my center backs 
if I go too far up the field, we're going to get conceded on again. There's going to be no hope. Yeah, and to kind of give an idea of how big a mismatch this was for City, in this match, in terms of low losses, Real Madrid lost the ball in their defensive part of the field 29 times. City lost possession in their low part of the field seven times. Wow. In terms of high recoveries, City had 22, Real Madrid had one. So the, the Real Madrid high press was not working. City was ultra efficient and Real Madrid just didn't have the answer. You know, the two mistakes by Varane just uh, tell us that uh, it doesn't matter too much if the fans are not there. Uh, even the big players, they can shake on the grand stage of Champions League. Uh, despite you know the crowd not being there to put pressure on you, and uh, Scott, on your point of Man City performing very well defensively, that's great news for Pep uh, heading into the the quarterfinals. The defensive, the defense was kind of a question mark heading into this game, as City have uh, uh, failed to perform well defensively in the previous editions of Champions League. There is a, so one Spanish team leaves the competition while another is uh, actually two other are still in. We know that uh, uh, Atletico already qualified back in, uh, in February and Barca beat three to one Napoli um, this past weekend. Alex, what kind of performance did Barca pull off against uh, the Partenope? It was a really strong one. We mentioned last week that, you know, Napoli would be licking their lips, you know, more or less because of the vulnerability of Barcelona. But the game was put to bed realistically in the first half, and it was a game of messy brilliance. You know, we go back to the X factor, and, and that was essentially messy. But I'd like to go back to the Mertens opportunity in the first half, that left foot volley, where Insigne plays that through ball, and it weirdly deflects. I don't know what PK was really doing there. kind of deflects off him and goes straight to Mertens. If Mertens puts that away, I think Napoli absolutely takes this game um, and beats Barca and goes through. But... On the other hand, you have you have a corner kick where you could argue that Langley fouls. Uh, I think it was with Dennis. He kind of pushes his neck there. Steve, you're smiling there. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think it's an argument. I, I just don't understand how VAR allows this to happen. It pushes right. him square in the chest, jumps over him, heads it in the goal. It, how it's not a foul is extraordinary. I think it's essential. I do think it's a foul as well. I also think it's because his hand, it's so obvious because his hands are higher towards his neck. If it's towards yeah. his chest, yeah. I don't think it's really that much of a foul. It's kind of him pushing to get some space. Um, but it is higher up on his neck. But regardless, you know, I, don't, I think VAR should pick up on that. But regardless, you do not want to concede against Barca. On a... I think I think the the other issue there is if you if we rewind a minute before, Cudi Bali actually kicks the ball out for a corner. Napoli have complete yeah. control possession of the ball, and he tries to switch play, and shanks it out for a for a corner. He literally kicks it behind himself, and um, and they score from the corner. So there's there's an error. You know, you talk about the the two Varane ones. For me, this is a high level centre back in a, with an error that no one really uh, has talked about, but. Yeah, those type of issues cost you goals. And in this case, definitely. Also, I want to point out another detail. How do you pair up uh, Deme with Langlet on corner kicks? Shouldn't you put uh, a center back on Langlet? I'm not uh, sure. I think, it, I think it depends if you're going to defend in a zone like Napoli do with the, with the, two, the two best headers in the, in the central zone. And then, you know, if you want to pair up markers, then, yeah, but I do think it is a mismatch, that one. That's a bit of a strange one. And then all of a sudden, Messi happens. And he goes on this run, as we're familiar with, picks up the ball on the right side, and uh, he just goes to work. The ball just, you know, even when he cuts the ball, it deflects. It, it falls back to him somehow. It's like he's got this magnet. And you see this all the time. You know, he, he plays a through ball. The defender cuts it out. And then somehow it ends back up to his feet and then he takes another touch and scores. In this case, you know, there was a point where you could pause the frame. And there was absolutely no space for him. There are three Napoli players and he's just caught in the middle. You know, you could say he's, he's fortunate there, but you know, he's kind of falling over, gets back up. It's a moment of brilliance. And then he shifts to, you know, put off. I think it was, it was Manolas. I think he could have put some off and then he's, as he's falling over, 
curls it into the far post past Ospina. Like it's a ri ridiculous play, and that's you know not gamed completely to bed, but you know that's a, that's a that's a heartbreaker for Napoli. And then he scores another beautiful goal. VAR calls it back. I personally didn't see the handball. You guys might have, but I kind of from the angle I saw it. He took it off his chest. Beautiful touch, beautiful finish. Beautiful ball again from De Jong, I believe it was, outside of his foot. Um, and, and he puts that in, called off. But then Koulibaly, as you are mentioning, Steve, he gets caught kind of dribbling up the field. He's, he's winding up with this. He's, he has a big touch, and then he has a big swing. And Messi sees an opportunity for him to just – you know, kind of place his leg right there. It's an absolute clear PK, in my opinion. I don't think there's any debate about it. Is he hits Messi? Messi would t be taking the ball, taking his first touch towards the penalty area, um, and then Suarez converts. Like there was a moment there where you thought Messi was potentially, you know, really injured, but um, but he was he was fine, and Suarez converts, and that that was the game. Even though. Um, Napoli got one later there on the PK with Rakitic. What, what, was he was he fine though? Because uh, he was an absolute passenger for for most of the second half, where he did what was needed to be done, but he limped his way through most of most of the game after that. I think if there's anybody else other than him, he get they get taken off. Well, Steve, uh, I would argue that Messi is uh, often a passenger during Barca's game. I, I know we have Scott and Alex that uh, watch La Liga games all the time, but. Uh, if you look at him, he scratches his ear uh, as the play develops. He waits, he looks at the defense, but um, and then when the ball comes in and around him, he takes a touch and he has these moments of brilliancy. Alex, you mentioned the first goal, uh, sorry, uh, Messi's goal, uh, how he was able to get a clean strike off while being completely off balance, and that shows how much power, how much strength he has on his on his legs. His low center of gravity allows him to. Um, always get up quickly and, and not fall down easily. But uh, uh, to Steve's point about uh, Messi being a passenger, Scott, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, I mean, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was Messi's first tackle of the year, right? The one on Koulibaly? Yeah, and the way he – it's so <laughs> funny because if you're Koulibaly, he's like – he probably looks back and he's like, uh, it's Messi, he's not going to press me. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, it's like a little rabbit. He comes by, and boom! It's just so unexpected, and he's he's quite smart about it. I think if Messi was a pressing player, I actually think he'd be pretty decent at it because he's so smart and he's so agile. He's got this little center. But then, would he have he's the energy? Like you, you know, like you said, he is, he is just there. He is just occupying space. He, he doesn't, you know, defend. But I would argue Ronaldo. Both him and Ronaldo don't really do that. But I also think it's a psychological thing, and it's a conservation conservation of energy. Exactly. Um, do I agree with it? Not necessarily. I think in order to be a player like that, where you don't press, you have to be at the level of Ronaldo or Messi. You can't be, I don't know, someone else who is subpar. I think the threat that they have when they're just walking in that area, you know, they occupy the mindset of a defender. If I'm marking Messi or Ronaldo, and they're just walking, even while we're in possession. I would still want like three guys around us just in case there's a counterattack because they've been resting and all of a sudden it's an explosive run or an explosive dribble or all of a sudden, you know, it's a change of pace. And that's when you fall asleep. Usually the defenders, when we have the ball, when we're in possession, you fall asleep because you think you're good. But then when you have Messi or Ronaldo who is just up there walking, you think you're fine. You know, you don't sense that energy or that threat, but the threat is always there regardless. So I think that is the argument against it. Although I don't, Hundred percent agree with it. To be honest, when would you guys say? That, sorry, on, when would I you guys? <laughs> when would you guys say was the last time that you saw Messi press fully committing to pressing? Was it the twenty fifteen team that won a Champions League? No, no, you can't. You, you can't uh, sum it up like that. I think there's moments people can make a highlight video of Messi pressing and be like, "Oh, look, he presses," um, but. If you're going to press, you have to press, you know, for the full time with the team. I, I, don't, I would argue that that 2015 team, he did more, obviously, and that's understandable because of his age and, you know, his, his physical status right now. But, um, but, yeah, I wouldn't say that he was a pressing player at the time. No chance. Hey, Steve, let me ask you this yeah. question. Um, if, if you look at, at the number of shots 
one team took 18 shots and the other took seven. Mm. You would think it would be Barca that that took the 18 shots. How is it that Napoli takes 18 shots and scores one goal, right? And (laughs) and are these, is this the famous city downtown from 25 and 30 yard out shots? I mean, I just, I don't, help me unpack that, Steve. Well, I think in the first instance, the the interesting part of it is both teams recorded 91% uh, pass completion rate in the game, mm-hmm. which is the highest ever uh, recorded numbers for a Champions League fixture, which mm-hmm. tells you just how just how important Napoli were to this game. Um, I thought it was a fantastic spectacle of, of football, really. Um, but like you say, with the Napoli side of things, it, it's it's no different to what we've seen the whole season with them, where they've been so so dominant with the ball, um, but a real lack of end product. The 18 shots, I'd be interested to see what the average shot distance was. I don't have that to hand, but I'd suggest that they were from outside the box, uh, barring one or two really good efforts that they, that they did have. But like 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 always, they struggle to break teams down. They have long periods of possession, like they did in this game as well. But they don't have the cutting edge. You know, you don't need a Messi or a Ronaldo to to score to score goals, but you certainly need somebody who who has the ability to take half chances and put them in the goal. Um, and that and they certainly didn't have that person there tonight. But what they do have is a lot of players who, who, who shoot from, from areas where they are dangerous. So Insigne, for example, is, is a classic example where he cuts in off that left-hand side onto his right foot and hits shots from in and around the edge of the box, two or three occasions, the, the same type of thing there. And then and then you get, you know, um, Rui and um, both Ruiz actually, the, the shots from, from distance, um, but they don't have that cutting edge final you know Alex mentioned the the Mertens chance early on you know he's got to do better in those those moments um it doesn't matter you could have 28 shots I think and and Napoli might have nicked one goal back given the stats so it was it was a brilliant a brilliant game but yeah Napoli I think are are, will walk away disappointed given given the status of the game yeah I mean I think maybe it's because they were testing they they saw that Barca has a weaker goalkeeper so they decided to take a, a lot more shots from distance from them. So. Well, there, there's, the, there's the shot where Tostegan lets it hit the post, which I think is the ultimate arrogance of a goalkeeper to know it's going to hit the post and, and let it hit and carry on. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You have to admit, Napoli really came to play, excluding, in my opinion, Koulibaly. And he wasn't terrible, but, you know, it wasn't at the level he should be. And it's just, yeah. if you break down these individual moments – you you can they'll look back and be like wow we, you know we had them they were good in the second half they got that late goal that late pk there was hope there i thought they they were better in the second half and yeah but when you play against barca what i bet what they were thinking about in the locker room was the liverpool matchup it's possible to come back against barca it's absolutely possible but you know they had their chances it didn't happen but i still think they came to play you mentioned the possession pass accuracy 18 shots they had their chances. I still think that Merton's chance is everything. I think it's absolutely everything. And then everything after doesn't happen, but we'll never know. Yeah, yeah that, agreed. I agree. Th- I think what you get from Napoli is what you get every week. And I think that's the, the best compliment you can pay them is you didn't see anything different to what you would have seen if that was a game in Serie A against, against anybody else. And, and this is a game against Barcelona. But unfortunately, champions champions win games for, for their teams and, and this is the, the case in this one. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it wasn't the case the day before with Juventus, though, unfortunately. Italy left with only one team in the Champions League because um, to Napoli's loss, also we are going to add Juventus's loss against Lyon. Well, they beat Lyon 2-1, to one, but Lyon went through thanks to the away goal rule. Steve, basically, uh, your prophecy uh, came true. Juventus is just Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, a brace for the Portuguese, but that wasn't enough to qualify the Bianconeri, who once again failed to pull off a performance. Yeah, again, I've been quite critical of them in recent weeks, how uninspiring they've been. And uh, this one was no different, was it? I think they just uh, they struggled to to match Leon's intensity. They struggled to match the 
the the pressure of Leon with their ability to play through the pressure. Uh, Scott talked a little bit about Real Madrid, you know, struggling to, to get out and, and find the way through and, and Juventus are no different. You know, if you don't have threats to run in behind opposition and you can't go round an opposition because you create width, uh, then you're going to struggle to play through unless you've got those players who can who can manage the ball and, and get you out of trouble. And Leon, Leon closed space down, made it difficult for players to, to face forward and, and, and create opportunities. And if you don't have a, a focal point to play into, like an Inter Milan do, where they can just bypass pressure by playing into Lukaku, for example, then you're going to struggle. And if you can't break a team down, when you do get moments of possession and you're relying so heavily on one individual to, to win games of football for you, then sooner or later, you're going to come unstuck. And that's unfortunately what's happened here. And it, and it's cost it's cost the boss his job, unfortunately, which which some will deem a little bit harsh and some will deem it to be absolutely fair. But um, yeah, they don't deserve to go any further in the competition. That, that's the bottom line. What a strike by Cristiano in the second goal. Out of nowhere from the uh, 20 metres out, he just uh, moved the ball across his feet and then released such a powerful shot with his left foot. Um, mm. I was a little sad to see Dybala coming in and then having to be subbed out because of injury. He could have brought the difference. But overall, I agree, not enough for Juventus. I do deem uh, Sarri's sack a little harsh. And uh, what should we expect from Pirlo's, with, uh, uh, from Pirlo's management? Uh, no ex- professional experience on the bench of any uh, top-tier uh, teams, actually. He was only coaching the Juventus under 23 for what was it a couple of weeks and now yeah, 10 days yeah. 10 days and now he's got the the main job um should we expect him to coach as he played uh, well he's certainly uh he's certainly going to be a company man isn't he I think that's the appointment <laughs> that they've made here um you know he's a he's a focal point um choice is he the best man for the job? Oh, I'm afraid we're not going to know anything about it. I read just they hasn't hasn't yet finished his qualifications. He's in the process of making sure he's able to do to 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 coach at that level. He's still got some some stuff to to complete, but I think it's a little bit similar to the Zidane appointment at, at Real Madrid, where you know, perhaps he wasn't ready at the time, but he was the right man at the right time. But to be honest, other than other than knowing about how he played as a footballer, we're certainly not going to know what he's like as a coach um, but there is a there is a precedent for this type of um, player in, in Serie A to do well you know you look at Gattuso and I think he's begun to prove people that he is a he is a very fine coach and I don't expect Pirlo to be any different whatsoever but yeah. it's, a, it's a bold move um, given the lack of experience but when you've played 140 games for your country and, a, and are a legend within it I think you could appoint anybody in that position and, and, and they would be they would be fine but he's probably got slightly longer than he, than he would have if he was a lesser name I think but he's got to win that just remember pretty quickly with, uh, with what he does He's definitely a thinker and a, and a master of the game um, mm-hmm. in his book I think therefore I play you know he did mention how much he hates warming up yeah. so maybe <laughs> Juventus will no longer be warming up because of because uh, of Pirlo at the head, who knows? Hey, if if I'm if I'm Inter or AC Milan, I'm sending bottles of champagne to the board of Juventus because uh, that means that uh, I I really feel like for uh, a coach to come in stone cold blue, it, they, they've just got quite a few disadvantages because Saudi had 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 already changed up the systems, and now he's kind of got a rebuild from scratch in six weeks right and you might be right he might be the right man for the right time and sometimes it's better to be lucky and if you believe what pep says to have a great team you don't need a great coach you just need great players and uh and so time will will tell on that but if if i'm milan i'm I'm giving high fives and i'm just so happy with the with them just moving that carousel along regardless you gotta wonder Pirlo, I mean, how desirable a job is this? Uh, I mean, sorry, came in, he got, you know, for a very systemized coach, he was only given one year to implement a system. There were really not the, the transfers that he needed to, to really uh, get the system in place. The midfield was awful all year, uh, just total lack of imagination. 
And I think the, the slow tempo of play was a big issue for Sarri. I mean, that's, that's a far departure from his Napoli sides of old. So, you know, this is a side that looks like it's, it's ready for some kind of a, a restructuring, um, at least a minor rebuild. So you got to wonder if, if Juventus will have the kind of patience with Pirlo that they had with Sarri, or uh, if they do give him a little bit more time just because of his connection with the club. So yeah. the bottom it, line yeah. is, the bottom line is this: if you have Ronaldo on your team, you've got one, one system you're going to play, and it's it's Ronaldo ball, right? It, it wasn't Sadi ball this year; it was mostly Ronaldo ball. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve and Daniele, but he sucks up so much oxygen, and that can be a good thing when it works, but it wasn't a good enough thing this year. Right, and it wasn't a good enough last year or the year before when it comes to Juventus winning the Champions League. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think the I mentioned it a while back about how long Ronaldo actually stays here, and whether they just need to regenerate completely. Um, but it depends how much you're desperate to win, and I think they've proven in the last two weeks how desperate they are to win by sacking a guy who's just won a league championship because they got beat in one game. Um, and as Ronaldo said last week, you know, they, they lost one game in the Champions League and it's all over for them. And one guy's lost his job because he lost one game, which, you know, unfortunately, when you're not, when your face doesn't quite fit in, in the environment, then then that, that will always happen. Um, but will Pirlo have the answers with with no coaching experience? He'll have some answers and, he, and he'll have some, some way of trying to accommodate the, the main man into the side. But will he have the experience of on the grass day-to-day -day work? I think he'll have to have a very good team around him staff wise to, to help him through this process. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be a disaster, but it's going to take some time for him to find his feet. That's for sure. And he, and what he doesn't have right now is time because the season starts in what, is it three weeks, Daniele? Uh, September 19th. So he's got about a month. He's got about five yeah. weeks to work. Yeah, and Ber and Ronaldo's going to be on the beach for at least four of them, I would imagine. So it's going to take it's going to take some time for them to get together and 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 prepare. Um, so they'll they'll be okay because they've got good players. But like like you rightly said, Chris, they have to regenerate somewhere. There's always already been talk that Ramsey is is on his way out there, willing to listen to offers for him this morning. You know, they, they, but they still have to bring players in. Um, and I think it's going to take some time. So from a, from a management point of view, if he fails here and, he, and he's, a, and he's an, a, you know, a, one, a one season wonder, does it impact on the rest of his coaching career? Does he, does he get another job? Like, like Alex said, it's a very difficult job to take this one um, with well, the recent I'll, past. I'll add a couple, couple points. Number one is I think it's really unfair how bankers are treated in, in this world, you know, they just don't get enough love. They don't make enough money. So poor Saudi uh, on, yeah. on the discrimination against them. The second thing is, is, is it completely nuts? These rumors about Ronaldo going to PSG, Alex, you have some insights on the, 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 the so, French side of it. What's well, your take on it? I don't think it's nuts because this is a guy who, who dominates everywhere he goes and he wants to win everything. And I think, he, if he went to Liga and he went to PSG, he'd win. That's a, it's, a, it's a guarantee, I think. The question is, what are the moving parts there? Where does, does Neymar stay? Probably not. Um, but a Neymar, Mbappe, Ronaldo would be just ridiculous. <laughs> you guys are forgetting about Mario Icardi. Mario Icardi. Yeah. Icardi is out. But got, okay, here's my question, though. Let's go back to the Lyon-Juve game with Saudi's job on the line, which many didn't even know was the case. Some did, I guess. You look at the first PK claim. Okay, a moment like that can change. Football is ruthless. A moment like that where it's a clear, clear non-PK. <laughs> it's a good tackle. As a defender, I, I hope to say it's a good tackle because my job is, is I'm, I'm quitting soccer now if that's not a good tackle. Sorry's job is lost based on that away goal is, is what you can say. And do you, do you think the board says, okay, you know, this is the moment, this 
VAR unfair moments. We're going to sack him. Based on, there's obviously stuff before, I think. But it just shows how ruthless the game is going back to this particular game. If that moment doesn't happen, Juve arguably are through. I think they would have gotten through. Alex, and that's, how that's is why it I, possible that this happens? That's why I think it's harsh to have sacked Sorry, And there are people who say, well, the PKs in that game, they evened out because Juventus had a questionable PK as well. But they don't even out because there is the away goal rule. So if we were to, I guess, remove both PKs, uh, it would be a 1-0 to zero score and the game would go to extra time. So the Lyon goal is much uh, worthier than the Juventus goal because it obviously happens away from home. Right. Um, but as, as Steve said, it's something that has to do with uh, um, Juventus' performance during the season. Scott pointed out the midfield has been highly criticized for, for the lack of movement. And, uh, and again, it's the image, right? He shows up with a, a, a tracksuit or whatever he wears on the, on the bench. And that's probably not what the image that Agnelli and Nedved want to give uh, mm-hmm. about their team. And that's why probably they selected okay. a classy yeah. man. Like Andrea Pirlo. <laughs> listen, listen. He, he can wear whatever he wants if he wins. You know, if he wins the Italian League and then they go through against Lyon and they go on to win the Champions League, he's going to stay on as manager no matter what he wears. My point is that you have to recognize that this moment cost this man his job. Like, I think it's... No, it's I, 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 think I disagree, it's so though. I, disagree. I think it's so clear. There, there's... there's- People walk in the corridors of, of Juventus HQ this week, fist pumping and, and high-fiving people because they've got the result that they wanted. And I think they've got the result they wanted because it's difficult to sack a guy who wins a league, but it's easy to sack a guy who fails in Europe. Now, it's, that's not unusual for Juventus to fail in Europe. You know, they've got a very, obviously, you know, issue, issue-ridden issue um, Champions League history in the recent past. But if you bring a guy in who what who, who, who has been famous for playing a uh, exciting possession, Sarri ball, whatever you want to describe it as. And not so much at Chelsea, but at Napoli and at Empoli where he was very successful. You bring that guy in, but you don't get that guy. Then you've got a problem. And when you have big names in dressing rooms who are just not having the coach, which is clearly obvious in this, in this regard, then they're looking for one moment, one thread to pick out where they can, they can move the next person on. Now, Absolutely. are you going to get anything different with Pirlo? Probably not. He's going to want to play a possession style of football. He's going to want potentially to, to defend in a, in a way that he defended as, as, a, as a player, you know, in that great AC Milan side, for example, where they played almost, you know, solely on the counter-attack. But he's a company man. So when he stands on the touchline, he looks more like Allegri than he does like Sarri. And I think that's important to Juventus and, and their supporters. And in this moment, Sarri won't have trouble finding work. He's a very successful manager, but he just didn't fit at this moment. And regardless of success, Juventus win the league everywhere. So it doesn't matter. People aren't, people aren't interested. That's not new news. But what they're interested in is getting to a Champions League final and potentially win it. If he makes a final and they get beat, I think he, I think he survives. But the quarterfinals are not acceptable. No, even um, in yeah. this round, so it's understandable if they move on and lose to City. I mean, yeah. I think at this point yeah. everyone would expect that, but you lose to yeah. Lyon. I mean, they, yeah. I think everybody's lowest rated team in the Champions League. That's yeah, yeah, that's totally yeah. unacceptable. So yeah. I, I think it would have been okay if they had won this match, uh, maybe yeah. to the, the chagrin of the board at uh, Juventus. Right. Right. But I think. It, I mean, I agree with Alex. I, I think he does survive at least for another year if they they lose to City and put up a fight. Yeah, um, yeah great. I mean, I, I don't understand the hiring in the first place. I mean, for such a, a highly systemized guy who does play an attacking brand, to come in after Allegri and, you know, that, that very pragmatic style of play, that, that just doesn't make sense, especially if they are in win-now mode. Mm. So that, that kind of drastic uh, shift in, in philosophy just really – didn't follow if winning the Champions League was the objective. Listen, worst case scenario, Pirlo will take off his uh, expensive black and white suit and just wear his number 21 jersey in the middle of the park and will solve all Juventus' problems in midfield. Uh, The other matchup was Bayern against Chelsea. Uh, The Bundesliga champion blew away the Blues 4-1. 
we'll discuss more in our Champions League preview, but let's go in order because we love chronology. The quarterfinal games will be played on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, beginning with Atalanta against Paris Saint-Germain, uh, Wednesday, August 12th. Atalanta is the only remaining Italian club in the Champions League, and uh, one of the big differences that stand out immediately between these two teams is the discrepancy in the annual revenues. Chris, I know you love talking about it. Atalanta has uh, an annual revenue of 150 million euros versus the 635 millions of PSG. But, you know, whereas Atalanta players show great harmony uh, when stepping on the pitch, PSG historically struggles to pull off performances in clash moments. And guys, I was reading um, uh, a piece on The Guardian this morning and they said that PSG are a gaggle of stars in search of a constellation. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, that's a statement. Um, a good metaphor. Yeah, I, I think I think they're very very similar to like a, a Barcelona star where or Juventus where they rely heavily on one or two stars to to make them make them shine. And they every week, you know, they they're dominant in their in their nation's top division. They they win more than they than they um, than they probably should do because they have better players. Um, Tuchel's come in and I think made them a little bit more tactically astute in in, in what they do. But in terms of the the way Atalanta play, I think they're they're as dangerous as. PSG could be here in terms of uh, an opposition. You know, they're going to come with a, a high energy, high pressing, get up the pitch, take the ball off from heart of the pitch. They've got weapons in all in all areas of the pitch that, you know, don't sell jerseys, but they win games of football. And, you know, regardless of how many shirts Neymar and Mbappe sell on, on nights like this, they have to come to the party. And if they don't, then Atalanta will win. There's, I don't, I don't think there's a doubt about that. But if one or two stars shine brightly on a night like to, on a night like that, then then they win the game. But you know, there'll be a lot of people who argue, oh, they've got PSG got the most, the best squad in the in the competition that's left. Yeah, they probably do, but they don't have a track record of success in this competition, and neither do Atalanta. But Atalanta every week are being tested and playing difficult games in comparison to what they have, and PSG are dominating a league where they should dominate and are not necessarily being tested week in, week out. And I think that's going to come down to, to this game and who wins and who loses. Atalanta will play with a 3-4-2-1 with uh, Sportiello in goal due to the injury occurred to uh, starting goalkeeper Golini. On top, there will be Duban Zapata, supported by captain uh, and number 10 Alejandro Gomez. And uh, Mario Pazalic should uh, start in front of Malinowski. Ilicic is not traveling. He's back in uh, his home country, Slovenia, for personal reasons. On the other side of the pitch, PSG will feature a 4-3-3. Uh, Di Maria is suspended and uh, Verratti and Mbappe. They have been called up, but they're expected to not start due to injuries. Icardi should be the center forward. Um, anything to add about uh, this PSG side missing, missing Mbappe? I think the key there is uh, obviously... It First of all, Mbappe, missing Mbappe is massive. You know, he can he come off the bench and make a difference? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I, I see Atlanta, Atalanta as the, as the advantage here. Um, Steve has some good points too. The way PSG can, can do well, though, is I think with a really strong performance from, from the center of the park. I think Marquinhos is going to play. You said Verratti's doubtful. So defensively, he's going to have to be in Gomez's face, because um, Gomez is, is very much, you know, super important to how Atalanta plays and then the creating side of it. They also have Gay, who's very good at um, at breaking up plays in the midfield. So I don't think it's necessarily going to be a very easy matchup for, for Atalanta. Um, but I just see them as more, like you said, disciplined, organized. Uh, they got this spirit about them, especially these last this last year, last couple of years. Um, that I don't see in the, in a PSG squad, but it is just one game. Um, so, so who knows how it could go? Um, Kim Bempe needs to be very strong against Zapata, Thiago Silva as well. Um, but we'll have to see. I'm, I'm really excited for this matchup. 
Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's it's one of those instances where you have PSG in a farmer's league, right? And they aren't getting any serious pressing. And Atalanta uh, is going to absolutely bring it. And Lyon has demonstrated a playbook where if they bring the intensity, they can beat on paper a team much better than them. You know, and, and I, I think we saw that with Real Madrid. I don't feel they had the intensity that a Man City has. So in my mind, the dollars are literally one extra zero in difference in terms of payroll. But the truth is, is that we all know that intensity and effort is the great equalizer. And I will always bet with the intensity. Atalanta has demonstrated that when they, in the last five games or a couple of times when they stumbled a little bit, uh, could have been fatigued. Um, so we'll, we'll, I don't know how to factor in the PSG more or less having the last couple of months off uh, and then injuring their most important players in warm-up games and trainings. And then Atalanta, who's had a really, really grueling period. And I, that's that's one of those box of chocolates you don't know until after the game. Yeah, I think Gasparini in the last kind of three or four games has gone a little bit more back to a box in midfield on top of the back three. So he's played Gomez and, and Malinowski. He's obviously not going to play in this one, for example. Just in behind the patter. So if PSG are going to win the midfield battle, like Alex suggested, then then they're going to have to manage against uh, times four guys in midfield. Um, and if they if they cut if they protect the central space, then Atalanta will go around the side of them, and you'll end up with a situation where you know wide players are dominating or getting higher at the pitch. Um, and it, and if they if they do that, Atalanta and and, and they can spread. PSG across across the entire pitch and it creates gaps for them to progress the ball into Gomez's feet and Gomez to connect into Zapata, then I think PSG have got real problems in this one. Um, if they play with a single six, then they're going to have to manage the, the situation where there's two tens against one six and how they operate that. I'm sure Tuka will have a plan for, for that and wh- whether he plays with a double six. Uh, but then, unfortunately, p- there's going to be times where they give up the ball in the deeper positions where Atalanta's two sixes can start to dominate in, in, that, in those deeper areas. And whichever way you spin it, the, the good players will, will win out eventually, maybe over two legs, but over one leg, I think it plays massively into Atalanta's hands here with, with a one, one-legged game, winner takes all. We're expecting a very entertaining game. On Thursday, Atletico will battle Leipzig. Uh, the game has been surrounded by some controversies as Atletico players Versalico and Correa tested positive for coronavirus. They won't feature in Thursday's game, but all the other players tested negative. So the game should not be at risk. Guys, this is the, the tactical game between uh, Atletico and Leipzig. Two um, master classes on the bench. I'm talking about Julian Nagelsmann and uh, Diego Simeone. Atletico will play a 4-4-2 with uh, Joao Felix and Costa on top. We are expecting to see Morata standing on the bench and Leipzig will not be able with their 3-4-2-1. They will not be able to count on Timo Werner. He joined Chelsea. So on top we should see Patrick Schick uh, supported by Nkunku and Forsberg. Guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> this, is, this is an amazing game in terms of um, the two coaches' approach to it from a tactical standpoint. Scott, enlighten me. So two very contrasting styles here. Uh, you will see Leipzig take the attacking initiative, and Simeone will be okay with that. His Atletico side has already made it through Liverpool. They prefer to initiate from defense. So you will see them sit back in the, the two banks of four and they'll look to absorb pressure and invite Leipzig to become more expansive in the attack. And then when that happens, that's, that's when Atletico hits you. So I think the rest defense will be very important for Leipzig. They have to make sure that they don't become too stretched and, and that they always have at least four players behind the ball ready to, to counter press that Atletico side. Because when they do move, they move very quickly. So I think controlling that transitional moment is the tactical key for, for Nagelsmann. So in this single-legged game, is, uh, do you expect Simeone to take a similar approach that he took against Liverpool? Yeah, definitely. So I think these 
whether it's one or two legs, it, I think that favors Atletico Madrid's playing style. So we've seen consistently that in the, the 38 La Liga game season that, you know, their playing style will let them down, that they will have issues scoring goals, breaking down opponents. But in a one or two uh, leg matchup, they're an absolute nightmare. I mean, that's just the one team every Champions League knockout round that, you know, I look at and I say, I really hope they don't, uh, my team doesn't get dark drawn against them because they're just a nightmare to play against. They're going to sit back. They're not going to give you anything. You have to break the low block. And, you know, as we saw from the Juventus and Leon game, that's a really tough task. And, uh, you know, I think Leipzig will be hard pressed to beat it, especially without Werner. Um, I do see Atletico making their way through in this one. And, and ultimately, I, I could see them winning the, the Champions League this year. Okay. That's a statement. <laughs> they're, they're set up for the one leg tournament. Steve, I see you uh, nodding, <laughs> but kind of uh, not well, nodding at it, the same time. Yeah. If they, if they do win it, it'll be about time because they probably should have won it by now in the recent past where they've they've been unfortunate in in finals or whatever. I think this this game is a, a game of intensity, um, and, and like Scott said, two contrasting styles. You'll find Leipzig want to get after the ball. Their passes per defensive action is is consistently low. In, you know, in the in the five to eight range. Um, and they bring their own intensity in, in getting after the ball. The counter pressing is, is a massive part of the Nagelsmann system and his and his style of play. But uh, Atletico bring their own intensity in that low block. So even though they sit in a low block, they're still pressing within that block, aren't they? Aren't they, Scott? They do try and get after the ball in certain areas. And even though they drop off and defend their goal, that they are going to come after you in certain times. And Simeone will will have little areas of the pitch where they're going to try and win the ball back and counter from because. It's all very well sitting in a low block, but if you can't throw your own punches and recover the ball, then your counter-attacking style is out the window anyway. So there's only so much there's only so much that you can do it in, the, in that regard. So it's going to be a real fascinating game, this one. You know, Leipzig have got a, a, a real um, style about bringing the ball out from the back and allowing one of the widest centre-backs, for example, to drive into the next line of uh, an attacker midfield line. So you're going to find that as a real, a real interesting moment where... You know, you'll get the wide centre-back driving into midfield. How Atletico deal with the extra number in there is going to be fascinating. And also, they'll use it as a moment where, like Scott said, they can counter quickly into the space and the, and the rest defence in that moment. So, yeah, for, for the for the hipsters out there, I know Chris gives the hipsters a bit of stick on this on this show. Uh, this, is, this is the game of the round for them, that's for sure. The other two games are Bayern Munich against Barca and Man City against Lyon. We already touched on these teams, but let's get some uh, uh, quick looks at them. Bayern Munich is probably the most complete team left in the competition. They have that goal-scoring machine on top. Robert Lewandowski, 13 goals and four assists in this Champions League edition. He is going to be supported by uh, Coman, Muller and Gnabry with uh, Thiago and Goretzka in the, the midfield. Uh, Pavard is injured, so uh, he probably won't feature on the right side. And Kimmich will take his spot. Barcelona, in their 4-3-3, they probably won't feature uh, Antoine Griezmann. It looks like next to Messi and Suarez, there will be Sergio Roberto. Alex, what should Barca do to resist this goal-scoring machine that is Bayern Munich? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a, simple, that's a simple answer. This is just a matchup that you really want to see, not if you're a Barcelona fan, but as a, as a neutral, I just think it's, you know, two titans of the game. Um, I don't know about this Sergi Roberto move. It's, it's a good move defensively, but I think Barcelona is really going to struggle to, to create um, with such a strong Bayern team. I'm really going to be interested about the matchups out wide. I know Chris will be interested to see the, the battle of the German keepers, Tristegen and versus uh -huh. Neuer. You're right. Um, if Davies starts, you know, how will he do if Messi's drag, dragged out wide? How will he do against Semedo? I think it's going to be interesting because they both have this ridiculous recovery pace that even if one of them beats the other, they'll recover. Shouldn't be an issue. Lewandowski is more than capable of exposing Langley and Piquet. Um, 
You think so? Again, it's, oh yeah. And again, it's just, it's just one, one game, which makes it last time they played was 2015. And that was the Messi Suarez um, Neymar edition where they absolutely smacked Bayern because Guardiola wanted to play a man mark system on Messi Suarez and Neymar. I, that was ridiculous. I That's think that Boateng remembers that game, right? Sorry? I think that Boateng remembers that game specifically. Yeah, it was, there was <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was not great. You never go man against man when you're playing against um, Barcelona. I think that's, that's pretty crazy in the uh, up front, especially against Messi, Suarez, Neymar. But look, that's not the case anymore. Messi's not as mobile. We've talked about him. He, he is obviously the difference maker here. He is, you know, the guy that their, their eyes are going to be on as everyone, as everyone knows. But I just think Bayern has so much going forward. I really see them taking advantage of a Barcelona side that got over Napoli, but I'd still argue not that convincingly. Um, I'm sure Steve would agree, Scott would agree. Um, but there's always hope. You know, there's always hope with with Messi, Suarez. You, you just never know how it's going to play out. But I'm just excited. I'm just really excited that we, we have the luxury of seeing a game like this. But I, I, I take Bayern as, as the winner here. Fair enough. And what about the Man City Lyon matchup on Saturday? Guys, do you expect this to be a comfortable win by Man City? I feel like it's a great chance for Pep Guardiola to finally get into the semifinal with this Man City side. Yeah, if they don't, if they don't get to a semifinal final this year with the draw they've got, I think they. They will see an opportunity missed. I think they, they've certainly, it's a bit of a watershed moment for, for their European campaigns with the win over Real. And yeah, the short turnaround won't, won't bother Pep too much. I'm sure he's been preparing for this one for, for a little while. I think he probably would have prepared for Juventus, but um, yeah, that, they'll, be, they'll be ready and they've got to play as well as they did against Real Madrid against, the, against this Leon side, it'll make it tough, but I think they just got too much for for Leon without without a doubt I think they they don't win it comfortably but they win it they win it um 99 times out of 100 well we have not forgotten about Europa League uh the competition is in the quarter final stage and uh, uh yesterday Inter beat uh, Bayer Leverkusen 2 to 1 after having beaten Getafe 2 to 0 Let's take a quick look at that game, Scott. You know, I know you have some stats about Inter Getafe and how that game uh, brought out a result that wasn't really in accordance with the statistics. Yeah, so when you look at a stat like expected goals, you know, maybe for the specific shot that was taken, it's not totally representative of the, the, the quality of the player and what's expected of him, like the, the Lukaku goal, the first one. It is a tight angle. Uh, he does have a defender in his path. So that's technically a low XG shot. Um, but just given Lukaku's effort, you, you do give him a better than average chance of scoring that goal. But on the whole, when you look at the way that game played out, Hatafe's high press was absolutely brutal. Uh, Inter really struggled to play out in the first half, especially. And Hatafe had a number of chances. You know, they, they did have the missed penalty kick, which was highly influential in the result. But when you look at XG totals, the, the result was 2.06 for Hitafe to 0.75 for Inter. So it, it was really Inter taking advantage of a couple of really good opportunities. And Hitafe, like, like they really have since the restart, they've just fallen on their faces. There's not the final product. And you know, that's really what we saw uh, since the return to play. So overall, a very good performance from Hitafe. They had their chances, but just unfortunately for them, unable to take them. So yeah, and then that, that of course set up the interim buyer match, which took place yesterday. So totally different script on this one. So for Inter, total XG for the match was 2.79. So a lot of high quality opportunities for them versus buyers uh, 0.59. So Leverkusen, you know, they did play a nice style of game, but for them, it was just uh, much like Inter in the, the previous matchup against Atafe, just a lack of that final ball um, and the end product really hurt them. So, but yeah, this, this Inter side is 
really looking good heading into the semifinals. And uh, they'll, they'll definitely have their, their eye on the finals. And I think that's got to be the expectation now, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in that game, all happened in the first 25 minutes of the game. It was a quick one, too, by Inter with uh, Nicola Barella and Ro Romelu Lukaku going, uh, getting on the score sheet. And Kai Havertz responded with a 2-1 two, two goal for Leverkusen. Chris, on the first goal, I'm talking about Barella's outside of the boot strike. Does the Leverkusen keeper not see the ball or why does it seem that he was a little late on that shot? He seemed almost lethargic and I think that's more a function that he didn't see it. It was just too much chatter going on in front of the box that by the time he saw it, especially, believe it or not, the slow speed of that shot probably threw him off even more because <laughs> you're not used to having a ball hit at you that slow. But guess what? Doesn't matter how fast it is, as long as it's going to the right right place where they aim. And that's exactly where it was. So so you just got to go hats off to the forward, grab the ball out of the net and, and get it at get get it back and, and restart the, the match. And Alex, I feel like you have something to say about the defending on Lukaku on the second goal. Too easy for him to spin the Leverkusen defender, right? Yeah, on the first goal you see his hold up. I mean his hold up play is exceptional. It's it's part of his game. Um, the best part of his game, I'd argue. Uh, when you get too close to him and you, and you just pin on his body, it's so easy for him to roll you and use your momentum um, against you. And, and that's what he did. I think in this case, the defender was way too close to his body and behind him. I would argue that you see an entry ball coming in. Don't pin up against Lukaku. Again, easier said than done because Lukaku takes up so much space. And if you want to go in front of him and intercept, you better make sure you get that ball because then you're on the wrong side if he uses your momentum and spins you and then he's on goal by himself. So that's why the safe bet is to stay behind him, let him receive the ball. But if you're that deep into almost, not almost, but close to your own goalkeeper, you can't just let him receive the ball and spin like that. But I mean... You know, you got to give credit to Lukaku that that is such a, a good spin and finish, like absolutely, you know, top class. You know, what I, what I love about Lukaku's game is clearly everyone knows the size, but you just see what an intelligent player he is. Um, there were a couple of times when he was in one-on-one -on -one situations and clearly the, he knew the defender was faster than he was, younger and faster, and he would he would just – slow down just a touch so that defender would slow down or he, and then he would make the cut or he would accelerate. And I just, I love how Lukaku, he reads the, the defender he's playing against, right? He's not, he's not arrogant enough to think that he can come always set the terms of play. And I just, as a goalkeeper, those are the ones that I fear the most because Lukaku is not, he's not going to drive the ball at my chest if it's a low angle. Uh, unless he absolutely has to. He's going to figure out a way to try to beat me in other ways. And I just really feel like Lukaku has just kind of put Inter on his back and carried him. And quite honestly, I think the transfer strategy that they've used of, of basically picking up uh, EPL players that have maybe lost their way or considered over the hill has been genius for Serie A and I think could really uh, um, pay off and – I have to imagine, as you said earlier, they may be, I don't want to say favorites for winning Europa, but they're certainly in the top two. In the other quarterfinal match that was played yesterday, Man United beat Copenhagen 1-0 after extra time. Bruno Fernandes with a PK at the 95th minute. He changed his run-up, didn't he? It seemed to me that the last step wasn't the usual jump with hesitation but rather a quick step before impacting the ball. Did you guys notice that? Yeah, I thought it was a good move. I thought it was a good move because uh, I remember I was watching it and I was shocked because you normally, when you start as a goalkeeper, especially Chris, I'd love to hear what you think. You study, you know, who's their PK taker. You study their run up. Bruno Fernandes is a very distinct run up. You wait for him to jump and do that weird jump like, and, and then shoot it. But here he almost, he just takes it super quickly. So you're not ready. And I think that I actually think that was a smart move. And if he's capable of switching it up like that, I, I think he absolutely should because it is so unpredictable for any any goalkeeper. 
it's unpredictable for every goalkeeper, but Hatafe, uh, the striker, changed it up too, and he ended up putting it to the left of the uh, of the goal. So there is risk. I will tell you, I liked Bayern Leverkusen's strategy of of sticking three three of their largest players right at, at the PK spot right before Lukaku was about to take it. So I have to tell you, it's nice to see people stepping up the gamesmanship when it comes to a shot that's you're supposed to score 78% of the time. I mean, that's the math. Uh, so you got to figure out how do you move that shades to the left, to right? Because that's a, that's the difference between advancement and not in these single-legged um, competitions. 26 shots for Man U, 15 of which on goal versus the only nine shots of Copenhagen, uh, of which none was on target. As we're speaking, Wolves are playing Sevilla and the winner will face Man U in the first Europa League semifinal. And Shakhtar Donetsk are playing Basel and the winner will go ahead to battle Inter in the other semifinal. Well, guys, thank you for uh, your contributions. We will be back next week to discuss the semifinals of the Champions League and Europa League. Arrivederci.